Great. Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome to uh, all of you who have plugged into this webinar. Um, my name is Danny Otero. Uh, this is my Zoom room. And uh, this is the second of four short webinars that the Triumphs Project is putting out this fall, fall of 2019, to um, acquaint interested parties in um, some of the primary source projects that uh, the Triumphs Initiative is making available. Um, I wanted to uh, especially introduce my um, OPI, Dominic Cleavy, uh, Central Washington University, and um, very much Ken Monks, our uh, presenter today, uh, and uh, an author of more than one project for us. Isn't that right, Ken? Yeah, yeah, uh, three at this point. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Um, in any case, uh, Let's see, I'll probably say a few more words about uh, Triumphs to start with, then I'll hand the floor over to Ken to uh, describe and discuss his project. Um, after about 20, 25 minutes of that, uh, we'll open the floor for Q&A. Uh, we might go a full hour, but that's not necessarily our goal. Uh, we want to be able to What's going on? Uh, give Ken a chance to describe his project and give you who've, uh, who are participating a chance to ask questions if you have any. So um, here, let me, uh, let me share you this. So um, this is the website for the Triumphs Initiative. Uh, you see the URL there at the top of the screen. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time here other than to uh, point your attention to that opening paragraph that is a nice summary of what we're, what we're all about. Uh, this is a project that has enjoyed funding from the NSF since 2015 to produce and uh, disseminate doing it. classroom materials for um, teaching topics across the mathematics undergraduate curriculum using primary sources as the um, as the focus for uh, delivering content to the students and having the students struggle with and hopefully understand the mathematics um, the other thing i'll point your attention to here at the website are the, the menus at the top. In particular, uh, over here is where we're going to be storing our webinars. Um, you can come back and see these uh, recordings later on, and uh, others who aren't attending today will be able to go back and see those there. The first of these uh, menus, though, is a comprehensive list of the projects that are now available. Um, for free to, uh, to anyone to download. Um, in nearly all cases, uh, the projects are also available in raw LaTeX from the authors. Uh, if you have a desire to uh, modify the project as written, especially if you're going to use it in a classroom for some particular purpose, uh, that would make it easier for you to uh, to modify the form. Um, the project is also still welcoming um, instructors who want to site test some of the um, PSPs, the primary source projects. Um, if you're interested in that, um, uh, you should probably contact uh, either Janet Barnett um, or Kathy Clark or Dominic Cleavy, uh, three of the, the PIs here on the project. Uh, 
Dominic, you want to say anything else about that? Uh, unmuting myself. Uh, yeah. It is true that we are accepting site testers for the spring and applications are open. Uh, you apply online before October 15th. Uh, let us know what projects you will plan to use and what class you plan to use it in. Uh, you may be chosen to be a site tester and that comes with a small stipend of two to five hundred dollars depending on how much work we ask you to do. Okay, great. Thank you, Dominic. <coughs> well, um, with with that intro in place here, let me uh, come back. Um, I'll turn the floor over to Ken. Uh, Ken, you want to talk about your project now? Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. Um, so the um, yeah, this is as as you know the um, a project that leads students through um, Euler's calculation of the sum of the reciprocals of the squares with positive natural numbers. Um, I guess the background in this sort of just the history of how it came about was um, I did my PhD in algebraic combinatorics. Um, so I really, really, really love generating functions. And so when I see a Calc 2 course, right, I see a, <laughs> an opportunity to introduce students to generating functions. And, you know, and uh, I think this, this is just such a cool, um, perfect example of that, right? And, uh, and it's something where it's, it's totally at the level that's appropriate to be talked about in a Calculus 2 course. Um, it's famous historically, and uh, the manipulations aren't, aren't that hard or that esoteric uh, where it totally derails your your calculus 2 course into a you know now it's a combinatorics course right it, it, it's appropriate within those within those competencies um, so the so yeah for me it's it's been super fun incorporating this into my class so um, so I used to have it in my course just as a just a proof that I showed um, just hey hey look at this this is something interesting right look sometimes um, sometimes you don't care about the power series as a function. Sometimes the information is in the coefficients, right? Sometimes we just want to use it to do bookkeeping for us and manipulate coefficients. Um, so I, I had it in there kind of just in, a, in that in sort of an example I would show the students. Um, and then at some point I turned it into a little project for them to work on. Um, and I think then basically I was site testing um, Janet Gaussian, um, Gaussian guesswork project. Um, and she saw this project while she was, she, she, which was not PSP at the time, she saw that project while she was there seeing the Gaussian guesswork site testing um, and was like, hey, uh, Ken, you know, the, you added some history to that and some quote, Euler quotes. And you know, like, this is not terribly far off from being a decent PSP. So, the, so I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Let's do it. Let's turn it into a PSP. So, um, so that's kind of the, the history of the, of the project. Um, the first thing um, that I want to point out is that the, the argument itself is really short. Um, so here I'll show, um, here I'll try to share screen here. Um, so what I'll show here is uh, it's so it's so short that you can see the whole argument on a 11 frame GIF. Um, so that's that's what I what I pulled up here. It, did it share a screen? Can you guys see the? Yeah, it worked. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that's the last slide. But uh, so this was here we go. Here's the first the first slide. So. Um, so this was for, for publication in Convergence, right, for, and then the online um, MAA journal about teaching and math history and where the, where the two collide. Um, so, so this was just for the, you know, for the, um, for the on-screen article um, to publish the project in Convergence. Um, I, you know, I, I wanted to make the point of just how brief the argument really is and from a for the instructor or for the professor, it's something you can read in a few minutes and oh, okay, that's that's how it works. Um, and so if you you know if you want an animation of it, that's this is where to where to find it. And and this is annotated with Euler's uh, with little quotes from Euler, so it's kind of kind of cute. Um, but so but it's a little hard to leave up for an entire webinar. So you can you can uh, see that if you want at at any point. Um, what I did was I did a less pretty, but maybe a more practical for a webinar version of that on the marker board here 
behind me where so I so I wrote out the entire argument um, and his you know, if you haven't had a chance to to look through the project or haven't encountered this elsewhere it's in plenty of other places um, like Bill Dunham's Journey to Genius and right, there's 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 other other pl plenty of other places where this argument is presented um, but it's uh, it, yeah it's a very short argument basically all you do is take the Oh, oh, Euler did it right. It's, it's essentially, take the sine power series, the standard one that you present in Calc 2 that you want them to be familiar with anyway. Divide both sides by the independent variable, right? So take sine of s over s, right? Cancel the s on the right hand side, um, and notice what the degree two coefficient is that it's negative one sixth, right? And then, um, and then you say that this function is it, easy to see what the roots of that function are. So you you know, take the graph of sine and just shrink the amplitude, right, uh, by uh, hyperbola, right, by one over s. And also notice that the discontinuity is removable um, because you have, right, if you, you can plug s equals zero into here and you just get the y coordinate of s equals zero into here and you get the y coordinate of one, right. So the, so the graph is what I have over here. Um, the main thing to notice about the graph is the x intercepts, right, the roots are. Uh, just exactly the same as sine, except for the one zero that we canceled at the at the origin. So the so the roots of this are plus or minus pi, two pi, three pi. Um, so then all we do is we factor, right? We just do one minus s over the root, one minus s over the root, one minus s over the root, and so on. Um, combine pairs with difference of two squares, right? Um, and then multiply this out after we factored it. Then undo what we did just a little bit um, because it gets hard to multiply this out in degree four or six or eight, right? So just multiply out the degree zero coefficient, which is easy, one times one times one times one. Then multiply out the degree two coefficient, which is just the sum of all the um, all the coefficients <coughs> of the s squared pieces of factorization. And once you've done that, then you just say, okay, the degree two coefficient of negative one sixth equals the degree two coefficient on the s squared term down here as an infinite series. Um, multiply both sides by pi squared. Just equa equate those degree two coefficients. Multiply both sides by pi squared, and you have the result. Right? You have pi squared over six. So that's um, this is the argument that I want the students to understand. I want them to see it and understand it. Um, and so that's kind of the goal of the project is just can they can they actually understand all the all the key steps? Um, and I would say that the design of the PSP is mostly centered around you know I've I've that I've done this semester after semester with my Calc two classes and they most of the PSP is centered around um, getting them past the the two they always get stuck on the same two points um, the two steps they always get stuck on is they is right here, um, just this whole expression, factoring to factor as one minus x, one minus the variable over the root, right? To factor like that, they they always get a little uncomfortable there. Um, right? Factoring as one minus x over the root, because which maybe is not surprising, right? In their college algebra class, in their pre-calculus class, right? The factor theorem is always stated as x minus the root, uh, right, is that your is how you build your factors. So they this always uh, always trip them up. Um, and I remember the first few times I the first few times I taught this, I I went quickly through this. I was like, you know, oh, and if you pull out the constant, it's the same as the normal factor theorem. And then I kept going, and everyone was like, where did the one by what are these ones coming from? Like, what, what are they doing there? So uh, <coughs> that's the one place where they um, where they got stuck. The other place where they would get stuck often is on this step where you're multiplying um, multiplying these terms back out to get the, to rebuild the degree two coefficient. So just getting them to see how this multiplication goes, they would they would get stuck here. You know, how exactly do we combine like terms? Um, so those I, I always noticed as the kind of the two key places where um, where students would would get stuck on this argument. Um, so that's why, if, if it seems like in the middle of the PSP in particular, if it seems like I'm really belaboring this thing about the factor theorem and how to write it, if it's like, isn't this something simple? Why, why do we have like 
three tasks on this little factor theorem. It's <laughs> they, at least as far as I found, the, I couldn't spend n enough time on that. That was that always seemed to be the the, the really difficult part. So, um, so that's that is um, essentially where you know the wh why there's so much focus in the on the PSP in that in that part. Um, so I'll, I'll pull the, the PSP up here um, again on the share screen. This one, yes. Um, so I'll pull the PSP up again just to to show exactly which pieces I'm talking about. Um, yeah, the, the first section is just, uh, I, I think the harmonic series is just such a nice warm up for, um, for, for this, right? For, for looking at the, the more difficult uh, P series, right? Let's start with the, the easiest to understand P series before we do this much more complicated one. Um, so that's, that's why I started off with the harmonic series. It just seemed a natural place to put it. Um, Right. The I, at least I remember in my calculus course, the I definitely saw the harmonic series, and I think it was we we do the integral test and it diverges and moving on, and we never said another thing about the harmonic series, right? And so I I think uh, I think it was just a nice opportunity to to put that in here as a one off. Um, and I found students are usually okay with this harmonic series section. Um, they they like the argument. They feel pretty good about the you know grouping terms into uh, batches that total at least one half. Uh, they they always feel pretty good about that. Uh, it seems to sit nicely with their with their intuition. Um, so that's the so that's the the first part. Um, the second part the they do they definitely seem to appreciate the historical introduction. Um, they in particular I don't know if it's just my students or if it's students in general, but the they they love the fact that the that the um, sort of elder mathematician who was uh, uh, Bernoulli, who was tutoring the, and visiting and mentoring the younger Euler, um, that that the elder one was stuck on it, and then later the student got it. Right? They they, they really like that. Um, it, 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 I think it appeals to. I, I'm not sure. I guess. I mean. I guess. I guess. Yeah. I guess it's just a cool tale of. It strikes some chord of maybe of human progress or you know the. But the next generation improved upon what the what the previous had, or or I'm not sure. Maybe or maybe it's just uh, I, don't, I don't even know. Maybe it's just um, you know Luke eventually becoming a more powerful Jedi than Vader or something. I, I don't know. What, whatever it is, for whatever it is, they always comment on that. They always love the fact that Bernoulli was stuck on it and then Euler got it. Um, it's it's every semester they comment on it. So it's kind of it's kind of fun. Um, so that so yeah so. Um, Right, section two is kind of short, just introduces the sum. Um, and then three is, yeah, three, section three is now where we go step by step through Euler's proof. Um, like I mentioned, uh, so, so some of it is, you know, translating, right, maybe words that, have, that are a little less commonly used today, like quadrature, um, right, arc versus angle, those, those sorts of things. Um, but then, so some of it is definitely looking at the time frame you're working in and some dis differences in language. Um, but then here is the um, kind of the key piece of it. Let's see. Is um, yes. He, here we go. Right. He he states the or well, states what the roots are um, of the function that that we're looking at. And then so here really task um, you know six six seven and eight are really kind of the the main part of the project where where I'm trying to get them to factor this. Um, and factor it in the way that Euler factored it, right? Where it's one minus x divided by the root as opposed to x minus the root. Um, and so the so this is where I pick um, in task seven. Task seven is the one part where I I completely you know lose the primary source for a minute and say, hey, we're just going to go try a simple example um, because because the one thing I guess that's awkward is. They're not only trying to use the factor theorem in a new way, but they're also doing it on a polynomial of infinite degree at the same time. So the so so that's where I found it helpful over the semesters of doing this to at least have one example where you do this other version of the factor theorem on a good old like degree two polynomial before you try this new version of the factor theorem on an infinite degree polynomial, right? So um, and then you know when I th when I thought about that and I was writing the PSP and everything it. it it made sense. I was like, oh, 
oh yeah, of course they got stuck on that step. <laughs> That's a lot of new things sort of all at once, right? What, we're factoring an infinite degree polynomial and we're, I'm sort of pulling out constants in a way that I'm not familiar with, right? So it, it, it made sense um, that that was a, a, a sticking point. So, so yeah, so here in, ta right, in task seven, I have, um, I, I have, I picked kind of just that random, uh, a silly little degree two polynomial um, you, you know, feel free to use that one. It also, if, you know, if, if you still find students are stuck in that, um, you could do one that's even closer to the, um, the infinite series. If you wanted, you could do something like, um, you know, X to the, uh, X to the fourth minus 16 or something like that, right? And if you wanted to factor that using this same, this other version of the factor theorem, um, where they could see, the factorization and then also see the difference of two squares. Um, you could do that. And I, I thought about maybe having another example where it also does the difference of two squares trick, but um, but it seemed it seemed with this one, even though it, it seemed like it was enough, it seemed like this example, and I, and I didn't want to belabor it longer than, than necessary. So it, it seemed like this one example was enough. Just, it's a, you know, a good old quadratic that they learned to factor in college algebra or before. Um, and then they, they seem okay with, you know, they factor out the, negative six, and they see that these are the same polynomial. Um, it seemed, they, they, they seem happy after they, after they did uh, task seven. Um, one thing that I would say is after, this is a revision that I might, a small revision that I might make for the, for future versions of the PSP is I have had students get confused. What does X squared minus X minus six have to do with Euler's um, calculation of the sum of the, right? And, and, and I, which is a totally valid question. And I, I realized later that I didn't, I didn't say in here explicitly, which maybe I should. And if you want, you could say to your students, by the way, this is, Euler was not working with this polynomial. This particular polynomial has nothing to do with, this is just a toy for, right? And I guess I say, you know, we work out a small example, but, um, but I, it, you might want to indicate, yeah, this, this is just for sake of testing out this other factor. This isn't, um, this isn't anything that Euler was playing with. It's not important towards sine s over s or anything like that. It's just just getting familiar with that factorization. So, um, yeah. So, so that's that's if you wanted a, a little comment to the students there. I have had a few students get a little bit hung up on that. Um, right. So then in task eight, then we apply the new factorization theorem um, to Euler's infinite degree polynomial, right, and his power series, and we we write this out. Um, right, and then the difference two squares part, they're, yeah, they're, they're always fine on that. Um, the last bit of it is this, um, yeah, multiplying out for the, the degree two coefficients. Um, and here I didn't do a big um, scaffolding exercise. Um, it, it seems like most of the time they're, they're okay with, with this instruction, right? I tell them specifically calculate the constant term as well as the coefficient of s and s squared, where the but they're sort of they they that phrase it usually seems like it's enough that they get oh I'm supposed to be going kind of one degree at a time and they they kind of figure out oh I don't have to fully foil out everything and then combine like terms it, it seems like that's usually enough to to um, to lead, coax them towards okay just think about what could the constant term be just think about what could the degree one term be? And then think about what could the degree two terms look like? Um, so that I think was, um, it, it seems like they usually get that. Once in a while though, I do have a student, um, so it's something to watch for maybe. <laughs> Once in a while I do have a student who, who I think based on muscle memory from college algebra or pre-calc, right? They, they want to first multiply all the terms out and you know simplify, like multiply the coefficients as they're multiplying, right? So they're getting, S to the fourth over 36, and they're getting us, you know, they're getting all these, all these things, and they want to fully multiply everything out before they start adding them together. Um, and so, so once in a while, I'll just sort of glance as they're, as they're working um, and make sure that that's not happening um, <laughs> if they're, if they're doing that in class. So that's, that's the only place that where I've seen people like really go off the rails because they, they just, they, there's this like deep, instinct where they want to do that, right? They want to multiply everything out and then combine like terms instead of just saying, well, how can we get a term of degree, blah, 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 right? And, and um, so, and usually even just a little comment, then they, 
they get back on the right track there. Um, yeah, and then parts B and C, they're, they're really just fine with. Um, and then, yeah, then there's a little historical epilogue. Um, they always, some of them are always super impressed and super interested, and then, and then, and then some of them, <laughs> some of them, I don't know if you guys get this too, some of them say the thing I always hear of like, wow, back then, the, you could tell there was not much to do back then or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> the phrase I always hear, and I'm always just like, why do you, why does it hit you that way? That's, no, <laughs> this has nothing to do with, I don't know, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know, but that's the side, I don't know, so, but, but some of them always think this is really, really interesting, um, and, uh, yeah, and they, and they do usually find the irony in task 11, which is, which is nice, they, I, I haven't had, like, weird, or, dismissive answers for task one and they usually they usually connect that back with Euler's opening statement right of saying where, where Euler says the it's hard to believe there's anything more we can say about p-series right <laughs> which is which is so great to think about him saying that 200 years ago and then all that's that's happened since um so yeah so that's that's how the how the PSP ends um yeah so that's that's I guess my uh Kind of where the PSP came from, why I laid it out as I did, um, and a little bit on you know what what my what the student experience has been at least as far as I can see. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's kind of my my overview. Is that is this a good time to segue to to Q and A? Sure, Ken. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, I would ask those of you who want to ask a question if you would. Uh, Introduce yourself first. Um, that would be helpful. Uh, I'm sure Ken would uh, welcome any questions now. I'm happy to start. Uh, I said hi earlier. I'm Dominic. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, do you do anything after this project to sort of that draws on it? Is there a oh. No, or is there work that comes up two weeks later? Okay. So kind of, they're in a few ways. So uh, after and and before, sort of. So what I do is I actually have, this is, um, the, the way I do sort of the middle part of my Cal 2 course is I, I lay out for them um, the, just the basics of power series. So, you know, just Taylor's formula, Taylor's error theorem, um, here are the power series for famous functions. Let's, let's build those together, you know. Um, how to substitute, how to do term by term differentiation, how, you know, how to term by term integration in power series, just sort of the, the, the very basics of it. Um, and I, I do just enough where they could then read and understand a project like this. Um, and what I do is I have, I have seven, seven other or eight other, seven or eight other projects um, that aren't all PSPs, um, but kind of at this level. Um, and what and one of them is is uh, Dave's um, uh, Euler's rediscovery of E project, right? I, that's that's one of them in the in the pile. And so some of them are ones I wrote, some of them was, are ones other people wrote. Um, and oh, and Jan, yeah, oh, and Janet Scassi and guesswork. The, the one of the just one of the because there's like four of those, but the the one that you where you could use um, binomial series to approximate that horrible elliptic integral that. That one. <laughs> um, For people who aren't quite as familiar with these, this is Dave Roosh and Janet Barnett, both of whom have written several projects that are on the website, and you should check them out. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so the, sorry, let me kill my, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, so here, um, so, so I have this pile of sort of yeah these eight projects and uh, and they have a lot of similar themes as each other. So for example, the which again of course the I you know I love anything that smells like a generating functions manipulation. So I so I have this one, but then I also I have a small one that I wrote on um, partition counting, right? So I have them you know use use power use geometric series to figure out how many ways to make change for a dollar, right, is like the, the big question of that project, right? Um, so it's, so it's sort of, it's, it's not project, a project that directly builds off of this, where they're, 
using facts in this, but it's, again, it's an infinite product of series that they need to think about. Um, so, so I have it where they, they sort of loosely tangle like that. Um, and, they, and the students present these to each other in a little mini conference. That's kind of uh, um, like the big the highlight of the, the middle of the course. Um, so three students do this Euler PSP, three students do Dave's Rediscovery of E, three students do the partition counting, three, right? they all sort of divide and conquer and then they do, the, and then we have these two days of class where it's the mini conference and they present. Um, so, so that's kind of how this relates to the other parts of the course is I'm, I'm, pi I'm purposely picking projects that where the techniques overlap as much as I can um, without having them all just do exactly the same project, but where they're where they're hopefully, you know, seeing the other students project and going, oh yeah, that, that kind of reminds me of what happened in the Euler project is that infinite series. You need to kind of see how I could get this power by combining these terms. And, um, yeah, and, and, then I, and then I do also have test questions on the content of the projects. Um, I, always, I always tell them in sort of, you know, in sort of normal, um, normal summative assessment style. Um, so the, and I always tell them, I, they don't have to fully replicate all the details of someone else's project, but they have to know what techniques were used, what question was answered, why was it an interesting question. Right? They have to know the essence of the project. They don't need to know every detail of every manipulation because there's eight projects and I don't expect every student to, you know, in, in 20 minutes or so, fully absorb someone else's, everything someone else did. Right. Yeah. All right, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else with a question? I have a, maybe a silly question, um, if I may. Ask um, is so it? Introduce yourself, Gavin. Uh, Ken, uh, thanks, Ken. That was great, Gavin Hitchcock. Yeah. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I'm curious whether st any students ask questions like this: What would happen if you started with cosine over s instead of sine over s? And the other question is: What else can you discover with the, a similar method? Do they ask questions like that? So I, I did once have a student um, rework this using cosine um, and because they were, it was a really ambitious student who was, um, who was convinced that, which was really cool, he was convinced that at the end he could, he read the sigma one over n cubed thing and he's like, oh, I'll bet if I start with a different function, I could get the sum of one over n cubed, right? Um, and of course, to which I said, go for it, please. <laughs> like, do, do, you know, I, yeah, I, I uh, you know, I, I, I didn't tell him that I had already spent countless hours trying such a thing and hadn't got it anywhere, right? Because I didn't want to say that. I want to, who knows, maybe, maybe he, he trips over it, right? I don't know. So, so I, um, I, I did have a student play with like that once, um, but but only only once. <laughs> so that, besides that, um, besides that one student who was particularly driven and, and curious, um, not not as much. I, I haven't had students ask so much um, spe specifically that question. What I have had students ask, which is maybe a similar question that I do get a lot, is um, how did Euler think of this? How did he think of starting with sine? S or or sine S over S. That that's the maybe the yep. question that's kind of in the ballpark of, of what you're talking about. That that they do ask a lot. That almost every semester someone asks that. And um, and what I tell them, them <laughs> what's that? How do you answer it? I yeah. The way I answer it is you know I say of course I can't know that definitively. I wasn't you know inside his head as he was working. But what I, the way I answer it is. Um, I answer it in the way that um, Tim Pentilla, who was my co-advisor at, at CSU uh, at Colorado State in grad school. So I, I answer it in how Tim Pentilla described mathematical progress and research to me, which is, he said it's the, you know, the art of firing millions of arrows and then walking down the field later, throwing, uh, taking all, almost all of them out and just one or two painting a few bullseyes around the around those uh, those one or two arrows and uh, so I always tell them that that quote from my co-advisor and uh, and I said you know I, I, I can't I can't know definitively but my guess would be Euler was you know he had this question in the back of his mind he knew it was an open question and 
one of his mentors had been stuck on it, right? And it was a famous problem of his time. And uh, he, he, I doubt he sat down one afternoon to and said, I'm going to solve the Basil problem and wrote sine S over S on a piece of paper, right? But more likely what he did was he just, just spent lots of time playing with infinite series because he thought they were interesting and lots of time playing with counter series because he thought they were interesting. And, and at some point he, you know, the, after shooting millions of arrows for not maybe for the particular reason, specific reason of solving the Basil problem, but just because he was playing, um, you know, of it, it was, saw saw this and was like oh my goodness i think this could solve the battle problem you know and then and that is that was more likely more tripped over from just doing lots of mathematics than it was i i mean not not to say obviously that euler wasn't brilliant but but less likely just mm, what's the perfect bunch of, yeah, i can start with oh there it is right i i, I doubt that was Maybe maybe I'm underestimating Euler. <laughs> I don't know, but but anyway, that's how. Regardless, that's how I answer their question. I, I tell them that quote from my co-advisor. Um, Marty, you have your uh, virtual hand up. Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, quite clearly. Okay, this is Marty Flashman. Um, Hi. And I have some questions about um, how much the students um, are um, teased or. Um, uh, come up with questions about the validity of these techniques um, without um, the rigor, because Euler is not exactly famous for being rigorous about his use of series. And I wonder if you've, you, in the course, before you've done this, you've done some examples of how, um, without some rigor, uh, series can lead to some obvious paradoxes. Um, so those, and I noticed that there's a footnote there about uh, Euler in your in your paper. In your in your PSP, um, there's a there's a footnote about Euler's. Um, uh, yeah, this is a task eight. Yeah, I can pull here. I can pull it up here. Uh, but uh, so yeah, I'm wondering, whether you or the students um, investigate uh, some of the um, issues with paradoxes with the abuse of um, symbolic methods in infinite series and um, whether there are any historical um, uh, articles or uh, things written after Euler that question his use of series and um, um, when does it actually become uh, rigorously, do we have to wait for um, Koshe or Riemann to, uh, or um, Rudia Strauss to straighten out the rigors of these proofs? And is that included in your, your uh, paper? It's, it's mostly not in, included in here. Um, I have, yeah, I have a little, um, like you say, I have this little footnote just sort of hinting that there's, that there's something there, right? Um, and that he's plowing ahead with confidence and not, not worrying about such things. Um, as far, so there's, there, I don't, yeah, I don't pursue it that way in the in the paper. Um, I do mention in the instructor notes that just that um, that this is actually a good starting point, not just in calculus, but if you want to say in complex analysis, if you're going to do Weierstrass product, you know, Weierstrass factorization, right? That this is actually kind of a nice starting point to that topic, right? Um, because it is sort of an earlier version of that. Um, so I I mentioned that in the notes to the instructor, but um, I as far as the students, they I, I do show them before this some some bit of uh, trouble you can get into with infinite series. I show them the you know the silly one equals zero proof from by taking one minus one plus one minus one plus, right and canceling strategically. So so I you know I show that and um, and in the past I've also showed them sometimes in the list of projects I also use another PSP Dave Rush's. Um, the Cauchy and Abel's definition of infinite series, um, but that one I don't use the whole PSP because the the whole thing is becomes much too hard for for at least for my calculus two students. Um, but the first part of it, they talk a little bit about what kind of trouble can we get into, uh, like what, what you're referring. So sometimes they add exposure to it in other of those presentations in the um, in that same little mini conference. They, at the very least, I showed them the one equals zero thing, um, but it's funny to be honest. The yeah, the mostly the students just aren't 
bothered by, <laughs> by that. And, and, and it's the same in, um, in, in Dave's um, Oilers Rediscovery of E uh, paper, like when, they, when he starts canceling like J with J minus one because J is infinitely large and he just cancels the, the right? so that, like those sorts of manipulations. Um, yeah, it, it, I've had, I found that the, the students, they don't seem to bother, it doesn't seem to bother them. If it, if it sits with their intuition, they just keep going. Um, I, I wonder if, and I think, um, actually I just implemented Dom's um, sine and cosine, Euler's sine and cosine derivative PSP. I just implemented that too. And, and same, the, the same in that one, right? As, as he's adding DX and saying, this is, this is infinitesimal and then just sort of doing some algebra and stuff. They, it didn't, it didn't bother them at all. And I, and I didn't, I felt like in calc one or calc two, I felt like that wasn't really the place to, I, I didn't make a big deal out of it. I didn't say, wait, but shouldn't this bother you? Yeah, you know, I, I, I they were they were doing great on the project, and I just kind of let them <laughs> let them go. And I figured I figured those questions of you know convergence and things like that they'll they'll really hit those ideas hard, and then they take analysis or complex analysis. Or, yeah. Well, I, I was just thinking that it would be a, it would be a, just a quick interlude in the in in the discussion to say you know these are these are really more subtle questions than we're looking at right now, and. If you want to investigate or are curious about those further, you should take the course in a further course in analysis. It's just to put a promo in, or there is more rigor. That is that. a nice idea. Like at the very least, expand footnote eight and just mention that there's quite a bit to be said here for, and quite a bit has been said later. Yeah, maybe you could find, figure out, you know, where would be a good historical spot to point to and say. And and these were actually cleared up later by X, Y, and Z. Or something. Yeah, I I like that. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. I really like that. Yeah, I think in that footnote, right, two or three sentences longer, and it like it wouldn't be a major departure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ken, if I could make a comment. Um, yeah. On the last page where you show the. Uh, the values of uh, zeta, the even numbers. Yeah. Um, what's interesting uh, and isn't mentioned here um, is that uh, the Bernoulli numbers are involved. So yeah. uh, Bernoulli uh, sort of pops up again, uh, uh, unsolicited. <laughs> of course, they're Bernoulli numbers, but Euler knew them. Yeah. Right. Uh, of, of saying of what those coefficients are. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's true. That would be kind of fun to tie that back, make it come full circle in another way. Right. But of course, you have to make some decisions. And uh, what right. you're doing here is fun. And uh, there are many ways you can peel off from here to, to investigate other things. Right. I, I also find it... Uh, um, really interesting that Euler is writing this before the uh, before factorial notation. So all of his factorials are are multiplied out. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah, yeah. And uh, even even uh, at the time he's writing, um, using the letter pi to stand for the the number is not quite. Uh, universally used. I mean, he himself <laughs> right. uses P instead. Right. Yeah. No, it is. It's it is fun. Even um, in the one place right here, right? Even just superscript notation for <laughs> for iterated multiplication, right? I mean, he uses it sometimes, obviously, right? Like down here, he uses it, but right. But today, it's like, what? Why? Why did you? Right. We would never write xx in a quadratic polynomial, right? Yeah. Um, is there anyone else with a question? Can I, uh, let's see, so can I ask um, how implementation is, is going? Because I think, um, I think we have a site test there, right? Oh, okay. 
Uh, if, someone said hello. To, if you'd like to talk about it. If, Can if, you guys if hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Karen Nelson, and uh, I'm at LR University in North Carolina. And so we're doing it right now in replace of like a checkpoint exam. So we've already talked about sequences in series, and I'm having them put all those pieces together. And so we spent a couple of days in class on it. And like it took them a while to get through, too, but I think it was a good exercise. Because I think for my students, it was helpful for them to see how to break sums apart. Two task two? Yeah, like back in task two. Yeah, yeah, right. Just even just all the notation of like having an expression in a subscript or, or in a stopping index or that kind of thing. Yeah, so it turns out like I did show them the theor the funky theorem versus the regular theorem briefly in class because I know you had said that that was something we should be careful of. Nice, yeah. But because I kind of hinted at that, I feel like they spent more time on this in class. But again, like, I don't think there was anything else up to that point that really forced them to dig into that notation and counting terms and things like this. So nice. I thought that was cool. Oh, good. Good. That's awesome. Oh, good. So the, so the section one you found to be valuable as part of the course as a whole. Um, good. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's part of also why I put it in there because I felt like it was a nice opportunity to, um, it fits in a very natural way with the, the Euler argument, but then it also hits just those classic key competencies that you want to hit anyway in a, in a Calc 2 course. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you. Great, great, great to hear. Oh, th thanks for trying it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's exciting having a site test. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, any other questions? Um, Ken, do you have any uh, last minute comments? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think so in, in particular. Um, other than I guess the comment just of that I have um, the little mini course, the mini the little mini conference structure to the power series part of the course has been super fun, um, and the, the students have definitely gotten a lot out of it. Um, so if I have available the other eight projects too. They're not all PSPs, um, but if if anyone's interested in those, I'm ha I'm happy to share those too. If you were if you were thinking of doing uh, doing something like that in your in your course. Great. Well, thanks very much, Ken, for this presentation. And uh, thanks to those of you who've uh, tuned in. Um, I want to let you know that uh, the uh, third of the four webinars that we planned this fall uh, is coming up uh, Friday afternoon. Um, we'll broadcast at 3 p.m. Eastern at the same Zoom room. I'm sure. Um, uh, a reminder email will go across to the uh, uh, the normal places where these reminder emails have been going, uh, and many of you subscribe to those uh, listservs. Uh, in any case, uh, thanks again, Ken. And uh, yeah, thanks for hosting. Thanks, and thanks everyone for coming. This <laughs> webinar will get uh, posted at the Triumphs website uh, in a couple of days. All right then. Bye now. Great. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thanks.